It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. This video is a direct collaboration from the YouTuber Beat the Cult. For those who have no idea who exactly is Beat the Cult, she is a YouTuber that has deep conversations with ex-Christians about theological issues, and I recommend her channel for those who have no idea about it. For today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're going to compare the various stories from Mesopotamia to the Bible, and the main sources for this video include the myths from Mesopotamia as well as the stories from ancient Canaan. The Bible is a very multifaceted collection of stories. There's about 66 books in the Protestant Bible, about 73 in the Catholic Bible, and over 80 books within the Ethiopian Bible. And because they're a multifaceted collection of stories, you have different theological points for every single last book, which would mean that the religion or the stories that they are told in the story sometimes self-reflect the culture, and sometimes for religions to actually jumpstart, they borrow elements from different cultures to make sure they get new converts. And so there are many aspects within the text that comes directly from Mesopotamia. The first five books of the Bible are attributed to Moses out of church tradition, but in scholarship, they use something that is known as the documentary hypothesis. So, the documentary hypothesis has the J source, and of course the E source, the D source, and the P source. Now, the J source is the Yahweh source, the E source is the Elohim source, the P source is the priestly source, and the D source is the Deuteronomy source. The main reason why they are doing this sort of categorization is largely because they have noticed that many parts of the Bible within the first five books have various different writing styles within the exact same book. Additionally, according to Deuteronomy chapter 34, basically Moses also dies, so it does not necessarily, you can say, make a lot of sense why a person that dies in his own story wrote his own book. Speaking about Moses, it seems as though that there's a direct correlation between his story and Sargon of Akkad. In Exodus chapter 2, it says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, he hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a pap for his basket for him and coated it with tar and pinch. Then he placed a child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket along the reeds and sent her female slaves to get it. The legend of Sargon of Akkad can be dated back from 2300 BCE. And the book of Exodus came out roughly around 1440 BC. She cast me into the river which rose not over me. The river bore me up and carried me to Anki, the draw of water. Anki, the draw of water, lifted me up as he dripped his eager. Anki, the draw of water, took me at his son and reared me. Additionally, we have no such historical records to actually demonstrate that a Moses actually exists or that the Exodus actually happened. And there's actually a documentary that goes into great details that's called The Bible on Earth, which goes in specific details about this particular topic. Just in the places where the Bible describes the exodus of the Israelites as they left Egypt, were there fortifications? Was there a military presence there that, that would have encountered uh, these fleeing Israelites? Oh, yes. Um, all over the eastern delta and in the Sinai uh, and up in the Negev and further north, there were permanent Egyptian garrisons and garrison points, checkpoints. Uh, in fact, the Bedou were constantly under, under watch by the Egyptian paramilitary police along the borders. 
A carving at the Karnak Temple attests to the existence of a sophisticated system of garrisons that ensured the logistics of a route that followed the north coast of Sinai. It was a strategic route for the Egyptians that led into Mesopotamia and Anatolia. A fleeing multitude could not have taken it without being spotted and stopped by one of its garrisons. This left them with the southern and more arid route, the one that is most in keeping with the biblical story. The Bible tells how, after having camped in the desert for almost three months, the Israelites received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. They then headed off towards the northeast to the land of Canaan. At that point, the biblical text tells us, they reached the oasis of Kadesh Barnea, located between the Sinai and Negev deserts. It is here that they spent many years after refusing to enter the Holy Land. The oasis was thoroughly excavated during the 1950s and 1970s. No remains from the 13th century, which is believed to be the period of the Exodus, were found at the site. Modern archaeological techniques enable us to pinpoint the tiniest remains left behind by simple herdsmen. And yet, no trace of the Israelites' long stay in the area is to be found. The absence of any evidence of their journey through the wilderness in either this oasis or anywhere else in the Sinai Peninsula is one of the enigmas of the Exodus story. How can you explain the possibility of a, such a large group as described in the Exodus story actually going out of Egypt? Is that possible? Well, I couldn't explain it. <laughs> Nothing of that shows up in the archaeological or textual record. And uh, one might argue that's a, an argument from silence, admittedly. But nonetheless, uh, we know so much about that period that uh, not to find even a single blip on the radar screen, as it were, um, it, it would be fatal to that theory. Moreover, the biblical account <coughs> has uh, 600,000 weapon-bearing males leaving, uh, leaving Egypt in the Exodus. That would probably translate into two million souls. Um, can you imagine two million people leaving uh, a country of the size of Egypt, which had only a population of three and a half million at the time? That would have made a huge hole in the, in the social and economic system that certainly would have shown up in the records. It would have resulted almost immediately in a downsizing economically and uh, socially that would certainly have disrupted the empire uh, irreparably. Nothing of that sort is found in the record. Not a thing. I couldn't see the Exodus as described in the Bible as occurring in the 13th century. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 is said, So God created mankind in his own image, and the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. This verse is a complete contradiction to the verse in Genesis chapter 2, largely because in Genesis chapter 2 it said that Adam was actually created first, and Eve was created after Adam when Adam was sleeping down and God used a rib to create Eve. Now the post hoc rationalization for this particular contradiction is that basically the argumentation goes that Genesis chapter 1 is actually a direct reference to Lilith and where exactly did the idea of Lilith come from? Lilith's first appearance in the ancient world was actually Gilgamesh and the Hoopa Looper Tree. The book of Genesis was written down roughly around 1200 to 1400 BCE, and the epic of Gilgamesh was written down roughly around 2000 BCE. The years passed, five years, then 10 years, the trees grew thick, but its bark did not split. Then a serpent, who cannot be charmed, made its nest into the roots of the Hoopa Looper Tree. The Anzu bird set its young in the branches of the tree, and the dark May Lilla built her home in the trunk. Gilgamesh struck the serpent who cannot be charmed. The Anzu bird flew with its young to the mountains 
and Lilith smashed her home and fled to the wild, uninhabited places. What's fascinating about this story is the role of the snake and the hoopa looper tree. The main reason why I say this is because in Genesis chapter 3 it says that the snake is more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God has made. It also says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 that the Lord God made all kind of trees grow out the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eyes and good for food, and in the middle of the garden, the tree of light and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what exactly does Gilgamesh have to say about this? A snake smelled the sweet plant that Gilgamesh left on a rock. The snake came out suddenly and stole away back to his hole where he ate it. After he ate in this magical plant, the snake felt rather strange. His old wrinkly skin began to feel loose and crumbly. Soon he silvered out of it and woke away using his new shiny youthful skin. And from that time on, snakes had always shed their skins. But when Gilgamesh came out the water and saw that the plan of immortality was gone, stolen away by the snake, he weeped and walked bitterly. As you guys can clearly see, the snake in both stories represent the bad guys. And so it seems as though that Genesis is using tropes directly from Gilgamesh in regards to the snake. So based upon archaeological data, it seems as though that in the ancient worship for Ashura, she was actually also represented as the tree of light. And so it might be entirely possible for the case of Genesis that when it talks about the tree of light, it might be a direct reference to Ashura, at least in my educational guess. There are two other cases where Gilgamesh have a direct influence in the Bible. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and eleven sons across the ford. After he set them across the stream, he sent over his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Enkidu blocked the gate with his foot, not letting Gilgamesh in. They wrestled with one another, locked like bulls. They scattered the doorposts, and the walls shook. Gilgamesh and Enkidu wrestled with each other, Locked like the bulls, they scattered the doorposts, and the walls shook. Now the context for that verse was that Enkidu was going to get married to his wife, which by the way resembles the same kind of story like Adam and Eve, and that's why they wrestled in the first place. But the most famous example so far has to be the flood story. What exactly is the history of the Mesopotamian flood stories? This article comes directly from the National Center for Science Education. It says, Yes, Noah's flood may have happened, but not over the whole world. The two rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris, flow through Mesopotamia, which is now the country of Iraq. There are several layers and exposed rock near the two rivers in southeastern Mesopotamia that are likely flood deposits, most about a foot thick, but one is much more than three meters thick according to the data. Now, flood debris came from the same stick deposit along the Euphrates River near the ancient Sumerian city, roughly around 200 kilometers southwest of Bangladesh that's been dated back by the C-14 method, given an age about 2900 BCE. So what exactly does the Gilgamesh story say? Okay, cool. So this is the Babylonian Ark Tablet text, and it reads, wall, wall, read wall, read wall, Atrahasis, pay heed to my advice, that you may live forever. Destroy your house, build a boat, spurn property, and save life. Draw out the boat that you will make, oh my days, on a circular plan. Let her length and breadth be equal. Let her floor area be one field. Let her sides be one nindan high. Your kanu ropes and aslu ropes rushes. Let someone else twist the fronds and palm fiber for you. It will surely consume 14,430 sutu. I set in place 30 ribs, which were one parsiktu vessel thick, 10 nindan long. I set up 3,600 stanchions within her, which were half a parsiktu vessel thick, half a nindan high. I constructed her cabins above below. 
I, appoint, I apportioned one finger of bitumen for her outsides. I apportioned one finger of bitumen for her interior. I had already poured out one finger of bitumen onto her cabins. I caused the kilns to be loaded with 28,800 sutu of kupru bitumen. And I poured 3,600 sutu of iti bitumen within. The bitumen did not come to the surface, lit up to me, so I added five fingers of lard. I ordered the kilns to be loaded in equal measure. I applied the outside kupru bitumen for kilns. Out of the 120 gur measures which the workmen had put to one side, I lay myself down of rejoicing. My kith and kin went into the boat. Joyful of my in-laws and the porter with and, they ate and drank their fill. As for me, there was no word in my heart, and my heart, my, oh my, oh sorry, of my, of my lips, I slept with difficulty. I went up on the roof and prayed to the moon god Sin, my lord, let my heartbreak be extinct, do you not disappear? Yeah, the main reason why it has like the periods is because like they cannot decipher what exactly does the sex say. So that's why it has the periods. Yeah. Then wow. from his throne swore as to annihilation and desolation on the darkened day to come. But the wild animals from the step, two by two, the boat did they enter. I had five of beer. They were transporting 11 or 12, three measures of sick bum one third measure of fodder and cordinu plant. I ordered several times a one finger layer of lard for the girmadu roller out of the 30 gur which the workman had put to one side. When I shall have gone into the boat, cork the frame of her door. Okay, so this is the Epic of Gilgamesh and it reads, Shuripak, a city which thou knowest and which on Euphrates banks is set, that city as were the gods within it. Ooh. When their heart led the great gods to produce the flood, man of Shurubak said, tear down this house, build a ship, give up possession, seek thou life, despise property and keep the soul alive. Aboard the ship, take thou the seed of all living things, the ship that thou shalt build. Her dimensions shall be to measure, equal shall be her width and length. That's, that's literally verbatim again. <laughs> Prince. Oh, my days. I understood and I said to Ea, my lord, behold, Lord, what thou hast thus ordered, I shall be honored to carry out. But what shall I answer the city, the people and the elders? Ea opened his mouth to speak. Oh, God has a mouth. Saying to me, his servant, thou shall then thus speak unto them. I have learned that Enlil is hostile to me so that I cannot reside in your city, nor set my foot in Enlil's territory. To the deep I will therefore go down to swell with my lord ear, but upon you he will shower down abundance, the choicest birds, the rarest fishes, the land shall have its fill of harvest riches. Yeah, basically the theme of animals is reoccurring in this too. A hundred percent, and the same beef between the gods, mm. you know, that he can't reside in the same city as Enlil. <laughs> He who at dusk orders the husk greens will shower down upon you a rain of wheat to deceive the residents of Shurupak, real and rain. With the first glow of dawn, the land was gathered about me. The little ones carried bitumen. While bitumen, the like, like, in, like in the first ever slide, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot to get that word. <laughs> <laughs> that and the, the big bum thing or whatever, John John knows, he laughed with his chat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, while, while the grown ones bought all else that was needful, on the fifth day I laid her framework. One whole acre was her floor space, ten dozen cubits the height of each of her walls, the dozen cubits each edge of the square deck. I laid out the shape of her sides and joined her together. I provided her with six decks, dividing her into seven parts. Her floor plan I divide in, divided into nine parts. I hammered water plugs into her. I saw to the punting poles and laid in supplies. Six sar measures about eight gallons of bitumen I poured into the furnace. Three sar of the basket bearers transferred, aside from the one sar of oil which the corking consumed and the two sar of oil which the boatman stored away. Bullocks. I 
<laughs> oh, goodness. You know what? One day people are going to read the way that we write and crack up. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years from now. <laughs> Ashley taking the mic. And I kill sheep every day. Must red wine, oil, and white wine. I gave the workmen to drink as the water. Oh my gosh. They that they might feast as on New Year's Day. On the seventh day that ship was completed. The seven launching, again, like seven again. It's like again with the seven. A hundred percent. It's right there. The launching was very difficult, so that they had to shift the floor planks above and below until two thirds of the structure had gone into the water. Whenever I had laid it upon her, whatever I had of silver, I laid it upon her, whatever I had of gold, I laid it upon her, whatever I had of all the living being, I laid it upon her. All my family and kin, I made go aboard the ship, the beasts of the field, the wild creatures of the field, here come the animals. All the creatures I made go aboard, here they are, from penguins to <laughs> Siberian tiger. Shamash had set for me a stated time. Oh, all the craftsmen were aboard as well. Okay. And then, yeah. When he who orders unease at night will shower down a rain of blight, board thou the ship and battle up the gate. The stated time has ar had arrived. He who orders unease at night showers down a rain of blight. I watched the appearance of the weather. The weather was awesome of behold. I boarded the ship and battened up the gate to batten up the whole ship to the boatman. I handed over the structure together with its contents. With the first glow of dawn, a black cloud rose up from the horizon. Inside it, Adad, god of storm and rain, thunders. Nergal, the god of the netherworld, tears out out the dam the anunnaki lift up the torches setting the land ablaze with their glare turning to blackness all that had been light I'd landed like a pot for one day the south storm blew gathering speed as it blew submerging the mountains overtaking the people like a battle no one can see his fellow oh again the theme of not being able to see anyone no one can see nor can the people be recognized from heaven the gods were frightened by the flood and shrinking back they ascended to the heaven of anu the gods cowered like dogs <laughs> <laughs> wow what are these weak gods um the gods cowered like dogs that's such a funny line because it's gods and dogs you know like <laughs> um Crouched against the outer wall, Ishtar, Ishtar is there as well. Ishtar cried out like a woman in Travai. The sweet-voiced mistress of the gods moans aloud. The olden days are a last turn to clay. It's all over. Because I bespoke evil in the assembly of the gods. How could I bespoke evil in the assembly of the gods, ordering battle for the destruction of my people, when it is I myself who give birth to my people, like the spawn of the fishes they fill the sea. The Anunnaki gods weep with her, their lips drawn tight, one and all. Six days and six nights. Blows the flood winds as the south storm sweeps the land. When the seventh prince day arrived, the flood carrying south storm subsided in the battle, which it had fought like an army. Yeah, when it comes down to this theme about the seven days, I would say that the origins of that comes directly from, I guess, ancient culture. Because for some reason, they thought that seven's like a day of resting. And you can see this theme all the time in the Bible, too. Because in the seventh day, when the God of the Bible rests, that's, of course, the day when he took off, right? The sea grew quiet. The tempest was still. The flood ceased. I looked at the weather. Stillness had set in and all of mankind had returned to clay. The landscape was as level as a flat roof. I opened a hatch and light fell on my face. Bowing low, I sat and wept, tears running down my face. I looked about the coastlines in the expanse of the sea. In each of 14 regions, there emerged a region mountain. On Mount Nisir, the ship came to a halt. Mount Nisir held the ship fast, allowing no motion. For six days, the ship was held fast by Mount Nisir. When the seventh day arrived, I sent forth and set free a dove. The oh, wait, dove wait, let's stop right yeah. there, right there. Like, basically, yeah. the dove is also a Noah's Ark. 
that's like one pack. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Let's continue on. Um, the dove went forth but came back. There was no resting place for it, and she turned round. Then I set forth and set swallow. The swallow went forth but came back. There was no resting place for it, and she turned around. It sent forth and set free a raven. The raven, yeah. Do you want to comment, Prince? Yeah, about the raven. Like, that was also in Noah's Ark because first he sent a dove and then a raven before he came out the, the ark. So that's like what I wanted to say. Yeah. The raven went forth and seeing that the waters had diminished, he eats, circles, claws, and turns not around. Then I let out all to the four winds and offered a sacrifice. I poured out a libation on the top of the mountain. Seven and seven cult vessels I set up. Upon their plate stands, I heaped cane, seed, and myr myrtle. The gods smelled the savor. The gods smelled the sweet savor. The gods crowded like flies about the sacrificer. As soon as the great goddess arrived, she lifted up the great jewels which Anu had fashioned to her liking. Ye gods here, as surely as this lapis upon my neck, I shall not forget. I shall be mindful of these days, forgetting them never. Let the gods come and to the offering. But let not Enlil come to the offering. For he, unreasoning, brought on the deluge, and my people consigned to destruction. As soon as Enlil arrived and saw the ship, Enlil was wroth. He was filled with wrath against the Igigigi gods, heavenly gods. <laughs> oh, I love that word. Igigigi is my new favorite gods. Um, has some living soul escaped? No man was to survive the destruction. Ninurta opened his mouth to speak, saying to Enlil, Who other than Ea can devise plans? It is Ea alone who knows every matter. Ea opened his mouth to speak, saying to valiant Enlil, Thou wisest of the gods, thou hero, how couldst thou unreasoning bring on the flood? On the sinner impose his sin, on the transgressor impose his transgression. Yet be lenient, lest he be cut off. Be patient, lest he be dislodged. Instead of they bringing on the deluge, would that a lion had risen up to diminish mankind? Instead of thy bringing on the deluge, would that a wolf had risen up to diminish mankind? Instead of thy bringing up the deluge, would that pestilence had risen up to smite down mankind? It was not I who disclosed the secret of the great gods. I let Atra but pass. Horror. Oh, horror. Damn! Direct naming. See a dream. And he perceived the secret of the gods. Yeah, so basically, it all comes back to Adaharis. <laughs> yeah. Now then, take counsel in regard to him. Thereupon, Enlil went aboard the ship. Holding me by the hand, he took me aboard. He took my wife aboard and made her kneel by my side. The final example for the case of Mesopotamia influence for the Bible will be the case of the Tower of Babel. The historical Tower of Babel is known as the Etiminaki. This image right here is an example of what the Etiminaki would have looked like back then. What's so ironic about this is that the Etiminaki was not dedicated to Yahweh worship. It was actually dedicated to the god Murdoch. I would recommend a book that is known as the Aluma Elish and it goes into great details about what exactly is the deity Murdoch. So when I read that story for the Tower of Babel, what I'm seeing is that Yahweh is saying that I'm actually the bigger God in comparison to this lower God. That's how I basically kind of interpret the story based upon the historical information. So there you have it. These are various stories of Mesopotamia that influence the Bible. What do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.